your boss put a contract out on your life. Yes. So this is a two-part question. What does that mean, actually, in reality? And what was the most most you feared for your life in your entire years uh, of being in the mob? Well, because I walked away from the life, I basically betrayed my oath, and Persigal put a hit out on me. I mean, the feds told me that. They said my father went along with it. You know, I mean, I had all of that when I was in prison. That's why they locked me down. They put me in administrative detention. But um, l let me tell you the deal. You know, one of the, one of the horrors of that life, Adam, you make a mistake, your best friend walks you into a room, you don't walk out again. Your best friend. Your best friend or somebody close to you, obviously unsuspecting, right? Mm -hmm. You walk into a room, you don't walk out. Well, I had that experience one night. And if you want, you know, I can take a minute to describe Please. it. I, it was all gas business stuff. A story came out, I believe it was in Newsday, I'm not positive, that said that I was getting powerful enough to break away from the Columbos and stop my own family. Total nonsense. It was ridiculous. It was fiction. It, it, not, it was no semblance of reality to it. But, uh, you know, I started... Uh, real quick, how does something like that become news? Is there, like, a know. competitor that decides we're going to screw with Michael or let's, let's you know, Who leak knows? some... You know, sometimes reporters just create... I mean, I, I can tell you so many stories that there was just no truth to them. Hmm. They just create these things, you know? I was pretty high profile. I was getting a lot of attention. And... Um, so guys, you know, on the street, you hey, you know, anyway, he's turning in this amount of money. Maybe there's more, you know, and it said I was making $2 billion. That was not true. And so, you know, Persico started, uh, you know, questioning some of my Russian f uh, partners and, you know, word was going around on the street. So my dad uh, was out on parole and he calls me up and he said, look, we got to go to a, a meeting. I go to his house. We're in the driveway speaking. And he says, uh, Junior wants to see us tonight. I said, OK. I said, what time do you want me to pick you up? Because my dad was on parole. He only traveled with me because I tried to keep him safe. And he said, uh, Mike, they want this uh, a little bit differently. They want me to come in first. They want you to come in second. Long story short, I was a poet. I said, Dad, you know to talk on the street. Why are they going to let them separate us? Let's go together. We were both captains at that point in time. We argued about it in the driveway. I think I might have told you this, Patrick. And I said, uh, you know what, Dad? I don't agree with you, but I've been listening to you all my life. If that's what you want, fine. So um, I drive in. It was late at night. We had to meet Junior in a house in Brooklyn because it was a covert meeting. He was on parole. Didn't want to get violated. So Jimmy Angelina, who was another captain of family, uh, I meet him in Brooklyn. He says, get in my car. We're going to drive to where the meeting is. I get in the car. There's somebody sitting in the back seat. Mm, never I recognize him, but I didn't know really who he was. Jimmy don't even introduce me. I get in the car, and um, he's very closed mouth. He's not really talking. You know, he starts talking about the Yankees. You know, I'm a diehard Yankee. I didn't want to hear about the Yankees that night. <laughs> we get to the house in Brooklyn. It was late at night, and it was about a 30-yard walk from the car to the basement apartment that we had to go into. And I get out of the car. I'm assuming Jimmy's behind me and maybe the other guy behind him. And I'll be honest, I'm, I'm getting scared. I said, this is, this is a bad setup. What's going on here? Now I'm thinking everything's going through my head. I'll be honest with you, but when, when I recount this, I can, I can smell the fragrance. It was oh, an geez. August night, wow. and I can hear the crickets chirping. Like That's PTSD. how real this was, yes. And I'm, uh, I'm walking down those steps, and uh, I'm scared. I mean, my knees are starting to buckle. I, I mean it. Because when that door opens, I said, the last thing I'm going to see. you got to understand. I mean, I've, I've been around such situations You were keenly like aware of it at that moment. Very aware. Of why it. didn't you run? You didn't? You know, people have asked me, Michael, why didn't you cut and run? And it, it wasn't heroic. It was robotic. You just become so much a product of that life. You say, well, if this yeah. is it, this is it, you know? And that's what I honestly thought. You know, I walk in the door. Obviously, I'm here. Because if it would have went the other way, I would have right. walked in the door. It would have been over. But... So we have this old big thing in there questioning me about the gas business and so on and so forth. And I started getting mad. I started getting angry because you got to understand, I'm turning in a lot of money, a lot of money. And, uh, and this was my deal. I mean, I put it together. And, uh, but then I said, wait a minute, I'm, I'm here with the boss. Let me calm down. You know, I'm, it looks like I'm going to walk out of here. And we get in the car and, you know, I was really angry with Jimmy. I turned to him. And I was uh, really That's your about friend, Jim. It was a good, my good friend. And he says, stop, wait, don't say anything. 
I said, what? He said, you know, you held yourself pretty good in there tonight, Michael. This could have been a real problem. And so now I got even more mad. I said, you knew this? You're my friend. I know you my whole life. You don't tell me anything? So he looked at me, he was a smart guy, and he said, if it was the other way around, would you have told me? And I thought about it, and I said, no. Damn. He said, you know, he says, this is the life we live, Michael. He said, you know it as well as anybody. You grew up in it. And, uh, and then I walked out of the car. I don't know if I ever told you this. As I'm, I, I didn't know what to say. I was kind of speechless for a minute. I mm -hmm. go to get out of the car, and he grabs my arm, and he says to me, I'm going to tell you something. You're not going to want to hear this, but it's the truth, Michael. I said, what? He said, your father was in there before you tonight. He didn't help you one bit. Oh, my he God. He hurt you. Okay, with that in mind. Well, here's what happened. Yes. I'm walking back to the car, and I'm saying, what, what could my... Then now that's all I was focused on. What could my dad could have done? But knowing him so well, I know what he did. Hey, my son does everything. I'm on parole. If he's stealing money, I have no idea. He just threw me under the bus. He didn't back me up. Why? At all. I don't know why. I'll be honest. I don't know why. I never said a word to him about this. I just kept it in. Never you never said brought it up to him? No, no, I never said a word. But when I was writing my first book, I put it in the book. I had to. It was too much of an impact on my life. Mm -hmm. Because I'll tell you this. If that incident did not happen, I don't think I would have ever walked away from the life. It was my dad's betrayal in that regard. Now, he denied it. That's not true. He denied it. But I knew it was true. But if I said to myself, this, if this life can separate father and son, what do we really have here? But the point being is after that experience, nothing really scared me. Wow. So what I did when I left the life, I said, okay, they're not going to walk me into a room. I'm moving to California. I said, they're not going to have to send a hit squad to come and get me. And I'm prepared. I'm not going to walk my dog at the same time every morning. I'm not going to go to the same restaurant. I'm going to stay out of clubs. I'm going to be very disciplined. They're going to have to work hard to get me. So I never was in fear after that time. I just was careful. You and, talk uh, about respect and loyalty a lot, right? But is there any trust or even friendship in this life? You know, there is. I had, I had friends and I had, you know, I, I trusted in people. But you got you to gotta understand something. When a boss gives you an order, it doesn't matter. <laughs> That's it. I mean, look, I had an experience. I had a very dear friend of mine that got killed. And I believe he got killed for the wrong reasons. And I could not save him. And they warned me. They said, if you warn him, you're in trouble. And, you know, I mean, I, I still live with that today. That's a horrible, horrible thing. Um, but... That's the thing. The oath comes before anything. And if you're given an order, you got to do it or you suffer for it. Well, my God, you know, and I really apologize if this comes off as disrespectful, so forgive me. But I mean, how could you ever look at your father the same way? I mean, how could you ever? I mean, you're a father. You you just had your fourth child. Is there anything in the world where you wouldn't take me instead? Like, my God, like, why would you? What would but ever but cause that, you? But to, that's that's why Sonny. The guy did 55 years. He didn't need to do 55 years. Sonny could have easily worked with anybody. And you, you're not dealing with a regular guy. You're mm -hmm. dealing with a true believer mafia, like mobster. Like, that's my opinion. I think you may say part of it that's a true believer, but it almost you know, sounds like a religious extremist. You know, the, the, the articles you know, like, written about Sonny are very different than anybody else. Patrick, let me tell yeah. you this about my dad. And this is the truth. And, I, and listen, I love my dad. I love him like, forget it, you know. So, but, but I'm telling the truth about him. My dad's legacy in that life meant more to him than anything. That's what I'm saying, yeah. He just wanted to be known as the stand-up guy. Yeah. Now, you know, all the good things he said to you about those guys, yeah. when he talked to me, this life is full of shit, Michael. I mean, he would tell me just like yeah. that. Really? You got to whine. Oh, yeah. Life is like a wheel. It's going to turn. The guy that loves you today is going to hate you tomorrow. We would go through. And he educated me, which was great. Good feedback, by the yeah. way, some of that. Great. Yeah. Uh, great oh, whatever he told me was spot on. There's no doubt about it. But I had, a, I had a conversation with my dad once, you know. And I said, Dad, you know, you don't understand. You destroyed the whole family. He got very insulted. I said, my mom, 33 years without a husband, she's a basket case. My sister dies of an overdose of drugs, 27 years old. My brother, drug addict, 25 years, turns into an informant. I said, you've got to claim some responsibility for this. She said, no way. I was framed. 
If I wasn't framed, none of this would have happened. I said, but dad, you weren't framed because you were a doctor, a lawyer, or a priest. Yeah, yeah. This yeah. is the life we live. They're yeah. coming after us. Yeah. And you sacrificed your entire family. He got very upset he with me. He probably got upset because he very knew upset you, were, you were close to the bullseye. He got very upset with me. He would never accept responsibility. And, and that's what kind of, you know, I was always, when it, my mom and dad had a very chaotic relationship they always back and forth they loved each other but it was always a lot of hostility in the house and i would always side with my dad always side with my dad and then towards the end of my mom's life i started to listen to her a little bit i started to see things a little differently so when i would pr approach my dad with that he would get upset with me mm. <laughs> michael for those of us that have no clue about this we're on time i have one other topic i want to sure. go with so if you want to wrap this up i got one other question i got for you but please if you want to wrap up no, so, you know, look, I mean, I love my dad till the end, but we had a difference. I mean, that that really Im impacted me, obviously, you know, that, that whole situation. So it was just different between us. More power to you for being, you've been married now for how many years? 37. 37 years, five kids, you have seven total, yes. right? Your family is happy. They love you. You see them wanting to be around you. That's the biggest a uh, way to judge a father or a parent if the kids still love the dad after 20 30 years their pops and moms they did some right if they want to be around them so that uh, props goes to you but i'm telling you when I, you know from my experience when i was spending those three days with your dad those three times that we were with him very different i've not met many people like him he was a fully like true believer like a general like a jack nicholson from a few good men that's like mm. what are you talking about this yeah. is like to that point of conviction duty yeah very dutiful very dutiful to not listen that doesn't mean other people believe that that doesn't mean you know you live that life so if you enjoyed this little short segment from the podcast that we did here's another short segment to watch or if you want to see the entire podcast click over here take care everybody bye-bye